For almost 30 years, I've been either an employed artist or I've run my own art business. I've never had a year in the red. I've never had a month in the red. That means I've never spent more in a month than I made off of my art. In fact, I've grown three art businesses and all three have been quite successful. Apparently, this is a rare thing. A, f a friend of mine was asking me, well, how, what's your secret, man? <laughs> how, do you, how do you do that? And I would say that, well, for one, I go against the grain and do my own thing. Uh, but two, I learn by doing my own thing. I don't just listen to what other people tell me and then just follow that as like a law. But I have created a, a number of rules for myself, and that's what I'm going to talk about in this video. This is essentially a top 10 list of the rules that I've developed, the guidelines that I live by that have helped my company, uh, all three of my companies to become quite successful. And of course, there's a longer version in my box set of tutorials for 2022, as usual. Of course, if you got your own thing and it's working for you, man, duh, you just, you know, do your thing. Do the thing that's working for you, man. But this is, in, this is intended to inspire some people who may have not thought this way to maybe think of some of these things if you're running your own art business or if you're just trying to get some work. Uh, number one is to find a need and develop that skill. A lot of artists will oftentimes just do the thing that they love and, ah, well, I really like to paint anime characters that already exist. And it's like, well, is there an employer who's hiring for that job? I wouldn't waste my time on something that there's no potential employment or customer for. So that's like rule number one. And I'd say like rule number one of business in general, but it's surprising how many artists this completely eludes. If you're having trouble selling your artwork, it's probably because you don't specialize in something that employers or the customers that you're selling it to actually want or need. And I would recommend that you just do market research, find out how much does an art job doing this type of a thing for this company make. Go to Glassdoor. Com. You can find out how much every job in the art field in any industry makes. Or do market research and make a product that people are already wanting. Okay, rule number two, take every job that comes your way. Unless if it's so far away from what you want to be doing that it's absurd. Now, I don't do this anymore because my business is not growing uh, in this direction, but there was about an, a seven-year period of time when I rejected no offers. If I was already working on a 40 hour a week project, I would still take on another project. And then I changed my way of thinking to ask myself, are there people that I could hire to help me to do more work in less time? And then I started asking myself, well, how can I train these particular artists to get about 80% of the way there with 20% of my feedback? So I'm literally reducing the amount of time that I'm spending on it dramatically while also giving an opportunity to other artists and simultaneously making the client happy because they're getting something that's pretty close to what they would expect from me directly. So rule number two is stop turning down jobs. Instead, ask yourself, how can I make that happen for this customer? In order to make rule number two work, you've got to have rule number three in place, which is essentially, this is about networking and it's not probably what you think. I'm not about brown nosing at all. And I'm also not about using people. It is very likely that most of the people you're going to become friends with or acquaintances with are going to be in your field. And it's going to be important that you have something to offer people, you know, help people out. So in short, just network and be cool to people. <laughs> just Whether you need them or not, try to be a good person to people not just when you need them. I hate all the fake people in this business. Get out. This is this is important when you're not just networking with important people, but network with everybody, okay? I would say that most of the opportunities that came to me were not because I was the most skilled, but sometimes it really is just because somebody gets along with you and they know you don't have some ulterior motive. It's like if you're a good person and you're, you treat people well, then good things will come to you. I can't say that being phony doesn't have its advantages. I've seen people who are incredible, just amazing brown nosers, and they rise right to the top. But, you know, they also always end up with divorces and personal problems and just all kinds of stuff breaking apart in their life. So ultimately, it's a better win to go for the long term gains of trying to just be a good person, I guess, just in general. I suppose that's a rule for life, not just like a rule for business, but it's helped me in business a lot too. 
A good way to do this, by the way, is to pass opportunities on to other people. They will be grateful to you and they'll always remember you. There were people who sent me jobs years ago, 10 years ago, and I'll never forget it. If I can, I will help those people out. They didn't want those jobs. They were too busy, but they passed them to me. They remembered me, man. And I make sure that those people who did me right know how much I appreciate it. Sometimes I overdo it, actually. I'm filled with gratitude. By the way, this, these aren't the, the things that you'll hear from other, some other successful YouTubers, mm -mm, but you know, that's why I'm here. Someone's got to say it, man. So rule number three is expand your, your network of skilled individuals and treat people well, which leads me into rule number four. I don't work with dishonest people and don't run a dishonest business. Uh, there have been some instances where I've kind of caught a whiff of a deception in the contract or in the verbiage of something that a person I was negotiating the deal with. <laughs> and it's enough for me to just, I guess it's as if somebody just spat in my drink. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in playing high risk games uh, with clients or business partners. I'm not interested in working with people who have hidden agendas or are just looking to use people to fatten their own wallets. It's no interest to me and no amount of being an honest artist or an honest business person is going to change their dishonest business practices. If you start to get a whiff that maybe in the conversation stage before you even got a contract, uh, if you start to get a whiff that maybe this person really doesn't value you too much, maybe they think you're just an artist uh, and, and you're a stepping stone for them to get to the next stage or get funding or whatever, maybe it's a good time to back out early uh, so that you don't spend the next two or three years trapped under their thumb. Make no mistakes, there are sharks out in them, there are waters, and there are, in fact, many people, many people who will have no problem using you for 20 years while they make piles and piles of money off of you. They have no problem using you for that. And you will get scraps hoping that maybe someday they'll be grateful. And they won't because in their mind, they did you a favor. So just walk away from those. Sometimes it may feel like you're walking away from an opportunity, uh, but what you're really walking away from is a nightmare. But running an honest business also means being sincere with the people that you work with, being straightforward, prov providing documentation, following through with your obligations. And that includes all the employees that you hire, anybody that you're working with. You have to be on the up and up with them. And you know, I'm not gonna lie, sometimes you lose. Sometimes you take one on the chin uh, because you're running an honest business and you, you didn't realize, ah, they got you. They got you with something and they get to walk away with their, their wins and you got to take a, a couple of lumps. And you know, the thing is though, is that sometimes you take a couple of lumps, but you, you don't lose the war. That's the thing. You got to keep in mind the bigger picture. And that's rule number five. Keep in mind your bigger picture. I keep a document that actually outlines exactly where I want to be and where I want to be in five years, where I want to be in 10 years. I am pretty much on track. I'm a little bit behind from where I set out to be 10 years ago. All of my decisions are based on whether or not it fits within that, that intended direction. Without some kind of a direction, you're wandering aimlessly. You might be going in a completely wrong direction and that might not be bad, but if you wake up one day and go, why the heck am I not going anywhere in the direction I want to be going? Well, it's probably because you never wrote it down. You don't know where you're heading and none of the decisions that you've been making actually have your big picture in mind. You don't accidentally become successful. You don't accidentally wake up one morning with a, a field full of corn if you don't plant a, a field full of corn. You have to plant what it is that you want to grow. Now, a lot of those things are pretty standard business things that you might find in any business book. So I'm going to dig into some of the things that have worked really well for me. So my rule number six is to invest in underdogs with great potential. That means hiring artists that are they just don't have an opportunity, but they're very skilled working with publishers that maybe they don't already have some big runaway success. They're still working. They're still trying to find their big success. And you might look at me and go, oh, well, you worked at Blizzard. You worked at Riot. You worked at all these big, huge companies. So that's not like investing in the underdogs. Well, guess what? When I worked at those companies, they were indie game studios. I worked at Blizzard before they were acquired by Activision. I worked at Riot before they were acquired by Tencent. I always looked for opportunities at game studios that had fun gameplay, but maybe they didn't have great art. So I brought what I had that was something that they needed to make their company more successful. 
When you're looking for those outliers and you start to learn what to look for, you find that there's a lot less competition. There's There were not a lot of people beating down the doors at Blizzard to get in. There weren't a lot of people beating down the doors at Riot to get in when I started at those companies. So I had a huge advantage. And then you find that compounds because once you've got a few successes, you can go to just about any underdog and they're excited to be talking to you. And that's a way better feeling than trying to get in the door at some company that ignores your emails or they act like snooty snobs when you go and meet them at, at uh, trade shows and things. They don't wanna work for those companies. You wanna find the mobile game studio or the small PC game studio that's just making like a really cool sim game that you like. You already love that genre. You already feel like, oh man, there's a huge player base for this, but their art's not great. And I'll bet they need good artists. And you know what? Most of the time they do because most people aren't thinking the way that what I'm describing. But this is thinking like an investor. You know, you don't jump on the bandwagon of something that's already huge to get the big wins. No, you, you try to find what's really good quality that's undervalued. As a side note, this is true with everything in life. You know, the neighborhoods you might buy a house in or the places you might decide to live in or places you might decide to move to, the people you hang out with. Across the board, man, look for quality, not just what everybody else is jumping on the bandwagon of, but look for real genuine underdog quality. And that means kind of ignoring what's popular and really paying attention to what's of high value, not just what's popular, but what's of high value to you. Okay, rule number seven, always give more than you promised and always take pride in your work, even if you don't get credit and even if you're not even getting paid as much as other people. Always, always give your absolute golden best, even if it's a budget project and even if you're uh, the lowest paid person on the project. If you're really sore about it, the only thing you can really do is leave. Go find yourself a better opportunity. And you won't find a better opportunity if you're doing low quality work. So don't fall into the trap of just doing budget, cheap, low quality work, regardless of what you're getting paid or the exposure you're getting or any of those factors. And you know what? That's going to bite you in the ass every time because you're teaching yourself to think that way. You're teaching yourself to give subpar quality. If you get trapped in always doing budget work, well, then you're going to end up getting stuck doing budget work after budget work. You're never going to get into those prestigious gigs. Nobody's going to give you a chance because they don't even know what you could do with more resources. So always act like you're, you're getting paid the maximum dollar, no matter what you're getting paid. Even if you take a, a, a little bit of a pay cut to do some cover for a comic or something, still give your absolute best because later somebody else might see that cover and go, oh man, I just want that quality and I'll pay anything for it. And if you find that you just can't muster the passion or the energy to give uh, more than 100%, then don't take those jobs. You always have the choice to just say, nah, I can't take that job. I can't give it what you need. I can't give it what it would take to make it excellent, to be truly spectacular. And that should be your quality goal every freaking time. If you're always reaching for the absolute most spectacular work you can possibly do, it's only a matter of time before people recognize that, acknowledge that, and then you're getting the rewards for that. Rule number eight, never lose your cool. And always, always try to see every situation from the other side. You may wanna scream at a client sometimes. You may wanna call out somebody who dogged you, did you wrong, somebody who betrayed you, somebody who just treated you like dirt, or somebody who said something nasty about you. Never do it. And the reason you don't do this is because one, you burn bridges. And then two, you build a reputation for being somebody who publicly complains about people that they work with. And then before you know it, you got people who don't want to work with you because you're a trash talker. Or even worse, you then, then you end up getting attached to all this drama. You're getting dragged into court. You're getting mixed up in all kinds of legal battles between people or just gossipy nonsense. And it ultimately ends up being more of your focus than doing the actual work. And it's such a huge distraction. It's not worth it. And ultimately, you're not gonna fix anything. The way to fix the world is through your own example. You can take those lessons with you. You can learn what not to do. You can be a better person yourself, but you can't tell other people how to be. They won't change anyway, because in their mind, they were never the bad guy. You will find better opportunities by focusing on just doing great work, but do not go around just bad-mouthing them because you could be getting, you could still be getting paid from that situation. You could still be doing contract work with that company, but with people you actually get along with, you may, you may find that the whole damn thing that you're butthurt about ended up just being a misunderstanding. So if you really take a step back and try to see it from their perspective, sometimes you might find out that their back was against the wall. They had to make decisions that didn't benefit you. You might be upset about it. It might have really directly affected you and maybe they don't even know about that. 
It was just a real mi big misunderstanding and you went and burned a bridge over a misunderstanding. So be careful to not do those sorts of things. And if you really need to vent for your well-being, <laughs> write your stories into fiction with fictional characters and fictional scenarios that are symbolic of what it is that you want to say to that person. <laughs> That's what I do anyway. Okay, rule number nine, treat people like people. Uh, FaceTime is important, for instance. The mental health of your team is important. You wanna ask for honest updates about how the artists that you're working with and the clients that you're working with, how do they feel about working on the, the stuff that you're working on? How do they feel about how you're working? I started asking for feedback reviews from my clients. They're like, we've never had a contractor ask us that. <laughs> I was like, well, I wanna make sure that you're happy working with me. I wanna keep working with you because I, I like it. I enjoy it. I wanna keep going. Just regularly asking the people that are doing art for you, if you're hiring artists, well, hey, how do you feel about the work you're doing right now? Could I reassign that? If it would alleviate some of the stress, being sure to consider what their strengths are and still challenge them too. Every person that works for you is a person too, and you were working for somebody else before, so you know what it's like. Try to apply that. I had a lot of bad bosses in my day, and uh, I'm grateful. You know why? Because I learned what not to do. <laughs> and I, hopefully it made me a better boss. So rule number nine is treat people like people, uh, whether you're working for them or they're working for you. Uh, it's very important. In fact, it's more important than the work itself, you'll find. Okay, rule number 10, uh, you're gonna need to adapt to become whatever it is that you need to in order to accomplish your goals. Uh, don't be rigid about the way things are, quote, supposed to work. Don't be rigid uh, or, or even demanding or angry when things don't work the way that you expected them to. Sometimes the way that something worked for somebody else isn't gonna be how it's gonna work for you. And I used to really get frustrated with this. I'd get very angry about it until I changed the way that I think. Instead of looking at something that somebody else, an opportunity that somebody else had, or, oh, it's supposed to be this way. Instead of looking at things like it's supposed to be this way or that way, I started asking myself, how can I get that desired outcome? Is there some course of action that I can take, whether it's learning a new skill or whether it's making a new connection or whether it's um, just doing more research? There's always a way to win. There's always some unique path, some opportunity, some way that things can work out for you you if you stop complaining about it not working the way it's quote supposed to and start asking yourself what you can do to adapt yourself to become more viable for that likely outcome but i believe that the same is true with almost any goal whatever that goal is if you ask yourself the question how would a person who is in this ideal situation that i want to be in how would they react to every scenario and every situation that they're facing if you wanna be a character designer working in AAA games, what does that person do every day? If you're doing that thing and you're studying the way that they study and you're building the kind of content that employers want, that those concept artists are doing on the games that they work on, if you're doing that every day, nine to five or whatever it is, 12 hours a day, however many hours they're working, if you're pushing yourself to do that without a manager, without even a, a game to work on, but you're building your own world, well then, hey man, it's an easy, easy win for you to get into that role later because you've already mastered all the skills to get there. So rule number 10 is to adapt to whatever it is that you need to be to accomplish your goals. That's gonna require doing some research. You're gonna have to find out, you're gonna have to write down what is your goal, where are you going, and what do I have to do to get there? And what would a person who is on that track, what would they do every day? What would they be working on? What would they be studying? What would they be putting into their portfolio? If your goal is similar to what mine has been most of my career, which was to work as a concept artist, character designer, uh, then I've created some concept art workshops for you over on my Gumroad channel. You can check those out and they will teach you everything that I did every day. The pipelines that I helped to develop at many of the companies that I worked at, what you should be working on every day, how you would get feedback, how you would incorporate that feedback, some uh, actually a lot of secret tricks that I developed over the years to make that job a lot easier for you and how to present your portfolio so that you can get that kind of a job. If you're not quite ready for the career in, in art, then maybe 
maybe you just want to check out my easy art lessons. Those will teach you the fundamentals, the basics, the beginner stuff that'll get you to the level where you can start actually charging for your artwork. You can start making a living off of your art. And for everybody else, uh, thank you so much for subscribing, obviously, and for ringing the bell so you get those notifications. I do appreciate you guys. I love hearing your comments. So if you have any questions about being a pro artist, please do drop those in the comments below. And I'll see you guys in the next video. All right, ciao.